Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is Dave Kozak with our special guest today, uh, Larry Recton, and uh, this is Elite College Knowledge. Um, we invited Larry on the, uh, the podcast because he has a, a great history in the world of academics. He's taught, he's coached, uh, and he's got great experience. He's helped our businesses and our previous businesses to uh, give some essay advice to students. Um, he teaches English, technical writing, language, and composition. Uh, he teaches AP and uh, regular classes, as well as coaches, I believe, track and cross country, correct? That's correct. Um, and he's been doing it for 30 years, 32, if we're being That's specific, true. right? Um, and, you know, the idea here is that, Larry, you've got a bunch of knowledge that you know, unless you sit down with someone like yourself, you may not gain over the course of a, a 30 year teaching career. So we really appreciate you coming on. Um, we'll start off with, with, with an easy one uh, as it pertains to uh, essays. Um, what do you advise kids or children or budding students to choose from a topic standpoint on an essay? For the, the college essay? Yeah. Well, okay. let's, let's yeah. be specific to college for this particular okay. purpose. Um, the best way to look at it uh, that I've tell students and the number of years that I've taught and given instruction in this is to, the first thing you want to do is think about something that you're passionate about. Um, the impression that I've gotten from talking to college recruiters and uh, admissions officers is they really don't need a listing of your accomplishments. They, they have all that. They've seen all that on your, your uh, application, your resumes, and whatever else that you sent to them. But really what they want to know is who you are, what kind of person you are, um, what makes you excited. And that can be a wide range of things. It, don't pick something that you think the college wants to hear. Your passion, your excitement uh, will come out. And what the other thing that the colleges can, can tell from that is um, two things uh, they're going to get is one is your writing ability. And that's part of what the essay will, will expose. Uh, the second thing is, is who you are. Um, and don't, you don't, tailor that to fit the college. Um, you, you tailor that to fit yourself. Um, maybe this is a further question, Dave, but you go a little bit further then. Uh, once you've selected that, what it is that you, you, you're excited about that, and let me make it a little more specific. Uh, it could be uh, mountain biking. It could be uh, playing the piano. It could be dissecting frogs. It could be uh, your, your youth uh, ministry at your church, uh, visiting elderly, um, anything that, that, that you would say, this really makes you excited. And then the next step from there is um, pick a specific example, something that happened, a story, an anecdote in your life that will reveal that passion and start with that, um, start with, um, when I saw the first time I saw the, you know, just making up the name, a, you know, Trex 3400 mountain bike and looked at, you know, this incredibly difficult trail, I knew this was what I wanted to do. Yeah. Or um, as uh, the, uh, you know, as I examined the bladder of a dissected frog and noticed its greenish hue and, and suddenly realized I was dealing with a diseased frog, I knew this is what I wanted to do. This was going to be my passion. So when you start with that, it makes you real. It makes it, it, makes it a, a real event. It makes you a real person. And I think that's part of what the essay does is the colleges are going to be looking at many, many students. And how do they distinguish them? Um, and I think, as opposed to being numbers on a sheet, you need to make yourself into a person. No, I agree. And I will say, I think the best essay I've ever read, the first sentence along the lines with the, the frog dissection was, I remember the first time I held a human brain. 
Mm-hmm. And that was when I knew I wanted to be a pathologist. And it was, I mean, and the, and it just got deeper and deeper in there. But as you, as I was reading it, it was like, I mean, it gives me goosebumps thinking about that mm-hmm. essay now. Mm-hmm. And the idea that this child was, first of all, in that environment to hold a human brain, right? Um, and then realized that, hey, I, I want to understand how this works and, and what the downfalls and, and what all that is. So uh, it was very, very cool to read an essay like that. So I think that's incredible advice. Um, and I think, you know, the, the point you make about it's got to be passion, right? Everybody, and, and we've done a bunch of interviews with admissions officers at schools, and the running joke right now is how many people are going to do essays on the coronavirus. And, you know, it's one of those things that everybody's dealing with. So there's not a differentiation there. Now, if you did something amazing as a result of coronavirus, then yeah, absolutely. Um, but don't start off with coronavirus made me this, you know, start off with what the passion was and why you got to that conclusion. Um, is there a, from an essay standpoint, is there a subject matter that you tell people to stay away from? Um, not really, other than listing your, your accomplishments. Okay. Um, get away from that. Uh, it, 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 this, and don't be afraid. Uh, a lot of times I, I, I've worked with students, I said, talk, talk about this. And, oh, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. Sound like you're bragging, okay? Um, no, it isn't that I'm the greatest pianist in the world, but talk about the incredibly complicated uh, piece that you mastered and the feeling and the pride that you got from that. Uh, don't, and, and communicate to the reader that this is a very challenging piece because not everyone knows about the, the technicalities of whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, I, I think that's the key. I don't think there's necessarily something to not write about um, other than like, other than just the, the listing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I'm sorry. And one other point on that, I, I guess the other direction I would go on that, David, I would qualify that just a bit. Um, don't turn your, your essay into something that could be controversial. Um, I would, uh, I'd steer away, if, if, away from politics, um, religion where you're proselytizing, uh, political comments where you're denigrating another side. Um, if you want to talk about your, your faith, absolutely. You want to talk about your political beliefs, absolutely. But be careful not to turn that into an attack. Yeah. And, and you know what? That, that leads me to another thing that I think you could probably comment on the Facebook, the Instagram, we're in the world where there is so much public information that used to be very private for everyone. And now it's out there. Um, do you give any advice to your students on staying away from that and the understanding that colleges will most certainly look at that stuff? How do you, how do you address that? Absolutely. Clean them up. Yep. Clean them up. Sanitize your page. Um, if it's, if it's that bad and, and, and we've all made mistakes and we've all, in our youth done things that we thought were funny and, and, and can be taken completely out of context and could be very embarrassing. Uh, clean all that up. Um, make sure, I'm sure you, you shared this with your uh, students, uh, make your, uh, your email a, a, a very generic, first initial, last name, yep. at whatever. Um, get rid of the cutesy names and, and those kind of things. That, that was great when you were in middle school. Uh, you're moving into adulthood. Um, go through your Instagram pages, your uh, everything, and remove things that could be misinterpreted or, you know, honestly are embarrassing in a professional aspect. Um, and I think the point you make there, Larry, is really, really interesting is that, you know, you are entering adulthood as you're applying to college and going there. And a lot of times, you know, if you've established an email address, that's one that's going to stay with you. I mean, I've had my D-A-K-K-O-Z, which is my, my initials and then the first three letters of my last name, since I was probably 15 years old. I mean, that's a long time running. And if you, if you establish that email address, you're going to, at some point, have to go through and change over. And that just makes it more difficult. And um, you, you want something that, that people can easily write down, jot down, and get to. Don't make it uh, the cutesy nature of it. Because at some point in college, 
you're going to be sending your resume to jobs and, and interviews and things like that. And, and that's not the time that you want to go through that. So I think that's an excellent point. Um, have you ever um, been involved or seen a situation where emails and, and Facebooks and, and posts and stuff like that had a negative consequence? And, you know, from a, either a coaching standpoint or from that, where it, it really narrowed the opportunity for that child? I, I tell this story to my students all the time when I when I talk about this particular problem in class, a particular situation. Um, actually, she was a former student of mine uh, who uh, got a job, teaching job, and was all set. She was she'd been through all the interviews down to the last rubber stamping uh, with the superintendent. And the superintendent, she sat down and and he brought up his laptop and he showed her pictures of her at a drinking party, you know, red solo cup in the hand, you know, standing by a keg. And, you know, he basically said, I'm sorry, we can't, uh, we can't hire you. Um, and that was to me, I mean, it, it, fortunately she found another position and, and, you know, it was, I think that's a very valuable lesson that, yeah, it comes back to bite you. This is real. This isn't, uh, you know, people really don't care about that. Yeah, no. And, and you know, the, the other thing I think that, that adds some weight to that is that's a red solo cup. That's a, a relatively um, mundane kind yes. of thing. But the reality is it carries connotation. And yes. if, if, a, if a school district or a, a employer is trying to avoid that connotation, they can say, Thanks, but no thanks, you know, and um, I think that's another that brings up another interesting talking point for us is that, you know, the idea that that um, what you've done can come back to bite you and and, it, and it's not necessarily that you did something bad. It's right. that the person on the other end has discretion. And you don't know what their discretion is and what their choice is going to be as a result of that. So why why even have it out there for uh, the topic to come up? You know, avoid it. And so I, I think the point you made about just clean it up. You know, make it something that if you're putting yourself out there, uh, make it things that you're okay and you're proud of people knowing, not the things that you don't necessarily want people to see about you. And I, I think um, you're, you're touching on something also, Dave. I think that we're, we're talking about here the negatives that you can generate with the social media. You can generate positives. 100%. You can turn that into the best advertising tool that you have yeah. um, for anything. And making wise decisions and saying, you know, what, what aspect of me does this photo show? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I always brought up a, 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 a situation I had when I was in college that was, you know, that we were pre iPhones and stuff with, with where you could take a picture right on the spot or a video of something. And, and, you know, the idea that other people can be watching what you're doing, you know, make sure you're putting yourself in, in good situations and, and not the bad situations. I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking about what you do personally or socially, but know that other people are always watching. I mean, if, if you look at the political environment we're in right now, you know, we're seeing everything at the front line for the protests and the, all this stuff. And so, and, and if you look at the news, everybody out there has a phone up, they're holding it and stuff is just captured, whether you want it to be captured or not. So um, be aware, I think is another part of that. And, and to the point of the positive, we, everybody in high school, they, they, they work tremendously hard right? We're, we push students more now than we ever have. Yes, we do. That's what you show. Show the hard work, show the dedication, show that stuff because it's easy, it's easy to advertise that. Um, you know, back in the day, and, and now I age myself a little bit, but, you know, it used to talk, you know, politics and religion were subject matter for private conversation at best. You know, don't talk about them because you'll lose friends and make enemies and things like that. Uh, but now people just lay everything out there. Um, and, and some conversations just aren't for the general public right. to have. And you can, you can um, if you take a side, the person that's viewing it could be on the other side and it can cause problems for you. So great points. Um, 
while we're on that subject, let's talk about the pressure of high school and, and what's happening now. You know, there's in, in Pennsylvania alone, there's a, a large or a high suicide rate at, at the teenage level. And it's, it's tragic to me that, you know, your, your brain's not even fully developed until you're 26 or 28 years old. And these kids are ending their lives as a result of whether it be bullying or pressure or whatever it is. Um, how much pressure are these kids feeling and, and how do you uh, help uh, and guide the children through that type of stuff? Wow, that's, uh, I, I think I'd, I'd agree that I'm seeing more, more pressure on youth than uh, I've ever seen before in my 30 years and certainly much more than I had. Um, and what I see, the students that I deal with, um, the pressure is more, uh, it is societal, but it's also a lot of peer. It's, and I'm, this is way bigger than you and I can even talk yes. about, is um, the electronics. The, it, you're constantly under pressure to perform, um, obviously academically within a classroom. Uh, I'm the one imposing that, um, and parents are imposing that. But the, the, the constant pressure to be someone with your peers, um, to respond quickly, to be, uh, you know, to send to reply to that text, because if you wait five minutes, you're ignoring them. Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, I, I don't. I don't know how they do it. Uh, it, it. I would go crazy if I if I was 15 years old. Uh, and you know, this is this is in this coronavirus pandemic that we're in, right? I've spent a lot of time in front of a computer like this, doing Zoom meetings and things like that, because it's it's kind of the normal that we've been forced into. And I, I have to just shut it off. I can't even go home and turn the TV on because I'm just tired of looking at a screen, tired of being so plugged in all the time. Um, and I look at, you know, even for emails for me, right? Email used to be something where I had to sit in front of a computer to read it and do it. Well, now you, you get it on every device. You can get it on your watch. You can get it. And so there is no detachment and, and you, can't, you can't even take a deep breath. And a lot of times what I, what I tell kids is, uh, as we're going through kind of the admissions process is, you gotta, you gotta take a step back, get some self-awareness of what makes you happy, what is your satisfaction level. You Very can't much. judge personal satisfaction on other, from other people's perspective, right? It doesn't work. Personal satisfaction is to you. And so, um, you know, and it, and it kind of relates back to that essay. What is your passion? What, what personally do you love and can you uh, display that on a, on a written essay? Um, so I think it's, it's huge that people are so plugged in. And, um, you know, as a business owner for me, I'm very plugged in, but the, the moment that I make a decision that I'm going to spend the time with my family or that I'm going to be out of the office, I shut it down. Um, and sometimes it irritates clients and I, I don't mean to do that, but I just can't be all the time on for business. I have four children of my own and, you know, we've, we've been very strict with our kids about screen time because if, when it goes, it can go, it just, they will just stay and engage. And it's like, uh, I remember, um, short circuit, the, the movie with Johnny five and input, you know, it's just constant input and coming at you. So. I agree. I, I think uh, it's, it's tough to, to navigate those waters. I listened to a uh, psychologist give a presentation on kind of the teen effect of electronics and things like that. And there is no break, you know, and that, that increases that pressure. And I think that's the pressure we're talking about. You know, academic pressure has always been there. If you want to be a high achiever, you got to apply yourself. Um, but now not only do you have to be a high achiever, you gotta be, you gotta be popular and you gotta, you gotta respond and you, you constantly be on it. So, um, how do, how, how, have you seen kids deal with that well? And have you, do you know what they've done to, to kind of calm that storm? It's, well, it's honestly, not really. Uh, I give a lot of advice on that, but I see it. 
it, it's so hard to, 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 to step away. Um, yeah. My advice is like, uh, for example, um, and it's become, because it's become part of a school. Um, most schools have given up, you know, no cell, no cell phone. It's, it's part of who we are. And I think that's probably what we need to do rather than teaching, stop using it, learn how to control it. Yeah. And, um, for, for all the, uh, youth listening to this, I don't, don't take this the wrong way, but you aren't ready at, 16 so I wasn't ready at 16 17 years old if someone handed me 24 7 entertainment that I could that I could walk away from it yeah that's a, that's a tall order um and so we're asking a lot of a, a lot of you guys so what I do in the classroom I know I'll, I'll I'll watch this and I'll tell students okay so we we take a break and we're time to work on an essay and different teachers will have different policies the policy in my room is that you all electronics are off other than you know, the laptop that you're working on. No, you can't listen to music while you're reading. No, you can't. Uh, and it's, they almost can't do it. It's, yeah. it's such a part. And despite what and students will tell me, I, I work better when I'm, you know, I'm listening to music and, I've yet to see one study, one analysis say that, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, although anecdotally, a few students that have taken my advice, I said, okay, here you've got, this is what you have to do tonight. And this is, I said, try this, just try it. You know, humor me, take your phone, shut it off. Don't, I mean, completely shut it off and put it someplace else. Put it in a drawer that you can't see it. No TVs, nothing, just go, and do your assignments and they'll come back to me the few that will not very many will try it the few that will try it will say they got done in half the time yeah well you I mean myself if i'm concentrating on five things i get none of them can do it you no know? um i there's a there's a picture of a bald eagle in in uh my the house my, my family's lake house and it, it's one of those sayings and it says focus uh, the bird that chases two rabbits will catch none. And the idea that, you know, you can't, we, I, I as a, a grown adult business owner with multiple business, I cannot focus on two things at the same time. It does not happen. And the moment that my brain starts focusing on a different subject matter, whatever I'm working on is lost at that moment. And I have to regain focus. I will say uh, to that point, I was, I was handed a CD. Uh, it was, uh, uh, better studying through Mozart, I believe was the, was the CD my mom gave me when I went to college. And I have also found that, uh, instrumental classical music in the background actually helps me lock into what I'm doing. Um, now my wife, she likes the TV on. I, I can't even, I, I can't get a thought out of my head when the TV's on. I, maybe because I go brain dead or watch it, but you know, the idea that there are tricks that people can use, and I, and I think some of it is find what's right for you, but, but the idea that you can have, you know, the phone, the computer, the emails open, I'd say the first thing I do when I go to write a blog or when I go to sit down and focus on work, I shut everything else down on my computer. There's no email dings, there's no alerts, there's none of that stuff, because the moment that in the corner it pops out and it tells me what the email coming in was, now I'm over here, and, I, I, and then it takes five minutes to get back, and, and you're right, I think to your point takes twice as long to do the task that you sit down to do. Um, how, how do students per, uh, receive the limited electronic in class? Is it, is it something that they, they get agitated about? Is it? Um, I think they know it's part of the system. It's part of the expectation. It depends on the, depends on the classroom, depends on the teacher, uh, depends on the expectation. Um, this year, I, I because of the distraction, um, I started, uh, and I know a number of my colleagues do the same thing. When you come into the room, you put your cell phone in, uh, it's like a, a shoe caddy. Yep. And that was very successful. Um, it, and it worked, that, that helped. Yeah. And well, that helped them focus in the classroom. And I think, you know, the, the other part that makes this difficult, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
you know, my children in the elementary school system, they get handed a, an iPad, you know, right. as they come to class. And so I think what they're trying to do is integrate the electronic learning as well as the, and, and I think there's some benefit to that. But um, I even had an issue with my, um, my first grader where they were on some other app that they weren't supposed to be on during that session or that time. And it's like, even the, the iPads or the computers themselves, there is an incredible amount of distraction within the power of those machines. Um, and so I, I think the, the point to come back full circle is mm -hmm. we have to teach how to manage that, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah. a real thing to oh, yeah. focus in on the fact that, hey, guys, you're going to have this technology. You can, if you have a question, you can get an answer. Uh, but know when to when to let that distract and when to kind of put that aside. And I think that was the point you were making is that at, at 15, I wasn't I wasn't capable of that, you know, and I, I would not have been prepared. Um, and even at, at 30, you know, I have a lot of my peers, I'm 37. And so there's a lot of my peers that, that I see them at sporting events and I'm coaching my children and they're sitting on the sideline, you know, on their phones rather than engaging. And so it, it's a, it's a, it's its own pandemic in my opinion, you know? Um, so th there's an interesting course you teach, uh, which is the 12th grade technical writing course. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's not necessarily for college bound people. Sometimes they're going into trade. Sometimes they're going military, whatever. But I think it's, it's fantastic because there is no better skill in the world, no matter what your job is, than being able to write and to write technically. You don't have to be gifted with, with language, and, and, but you have to be able to write clear, cohesive sentences. Talk a little bit about what that class is and, and what you focus on there. The, the focus of that course is for students who are plan to really terminate their formal education as the classroom type education. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the students are at our technical school, the uh, Western Montgomery County uh, Votech School. Um, so they really don't, the formal classroom doesn't fit them. Yep. Um, they're not going to write literary analysis essays ever again, and it means nothing to them. Um, they're, they've selected, uh, or, or students who maybe they don't know what they want to do career-wise, but they know they want to get out into the working world right now. So what we do is, or what I try and do is yep. teach them skills that they can use in the working world. For example, um, we do a, a unit on writing directions, clear directions on how to do something. Um, which is a skill that many people don't realize how, how critical it is. Uh, and I asked my students before we started, I said, have you ever had a teacher give you directions? And that's what, what we do all day long. That didn't make any sense or you couldn't understand. And of course they're all, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they start naming names. And yep. I said, you know how frustrating it is. Now imagine that you're in a workplace and, and your foreman comes to you and say, here, this is what I need you to create. I need you to build. And it's not clear. It's the, the pronouns are mixed up. The, uh, your, the, the verb, the past and present tense verbs don't match. That may seem like a minor grammatical thing, but that writing error might cost you thousands, tens of thousands of dollars because of what you had, you had written. Um, so we do a lot of that, um, how to write directions, you know, with you, uh, incorporating illustrations into your, into your directions. And, um, you know, I don't get into the weeds of it all, but um, that's a piece of it. We do even, even part of it is how to listen, which is kind of what we've just been talking about. Um, removing distractions, how to give directions orally, um, we, uh, the technical writing course also, we break it down into, and I know this isn't as critical as it's once been, um, how to write good business letters, how to write a good email. Um, many of my students don't understand that there's a difference between texting someone yeah. and emailing them. Yeah, there is. And the, the, the type of writing that it expects and requires. Yes, and an email is less formal than a business letter, 
and then we elevate it to that. How do I write a, a letter of introduction about myself, a mm -hmm. business letter? Um, things in, in to even to the level of we do a whole unit on how to do a job interview mm -hmm. how to, or any kind of an interview. Um, what do I wear? What are the manners that are expected uh, when someone walks into an office? Um, how do you address questions like, tell me about yourself? Um, how do I address a question like, um, what kind of salary do you expect? Mm -hmm. um, even things like this is, when you walk away from an interview, I, I make a big deal out of sending a thank you letter. Not a thank you email, a physical thank you letter and how critical that is to, and how unusual that is. You want someone to remember you. They, they might be doing six or seven interviews. You want them to remember who you are. Send them a thank you letter. You're probably gonna be the only one to do that. Yep. And, I, and, and to that comment, Larry, I'm in the, in the uh, professional world, uh, financial advising, college advising, insurance, and all that. And I send thank you letters. You know, uh, I, the people that I hire are the ones that follow up. And I'm, I have sal large salaries and, and we're looking for, you know, people with master's degrees and things like that. And I look for that stuff. So it's not, it's, it doesn't matter what level you're at. You want to stand out. You write that letter and you write it. And again, that kind of goes back to the essay subject that you were talking about. You write it from here. You know, it's a thank you. I, you know, you pick up something out of the conversation and, and comment on it. And I appreciate your candor and things like that that actually gets a little bit of who you are. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be perfect. No. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a handwritten letter. One thing I will say, and, and I don't know if you stress this anymore, but one thing that I stress in my business is anybody that comes in with sloppy handwriting, I force them to work on it. Because if somebody else can't read it and you're putting it forward um, and it looks like a child wrote it or it looks like chicken scratch, it does not bode well for anything you're doing. And I spend a lot of time uh, on a whiteboard writing in front of people and I had to work. I mean, I had to spend significant time getting back to making my letters right so that the people that are reading it have the ability to understand what I'm writing. And so um, it's, it, you don't have to have uh, calligraphy or cursive, but you have to be able to write clearly um, so that people can read it. Um, let, let's go and, and shift gears a little bit and, and talk about letters of recommendation. I'm sure in your tenure, you've written um, many a letter of recommendation. Um, give me a little inside information on, on what you look for and, and what, what kids come to you? What, what, what students actually choose you and why do you think they choose you? Um, a couple of things that I would note on that, um, one of the things that I tell my students, particularly my AP students, because often these are the ones who are applying to colleges, and I have them as when they're juniors. That's the okay. Baltimore class. Yep. So they're going to be writing letters over this, uh, for the following spring. I recommend to them, do that. If you want me to write you a good letter of recommendation, request it over the summer. Mm -hmm. okay, and and that's not every teacher. Some teachers, like my summers are sacred. I don't. Um, but... Honestly, when, when I get into the fall, that's, I'm, a, I'm a cross country coach. So I'm buried in, in, in the season, I'm buried in my lessons. And you come to me, uh, can you light, write a letter of recommendation? Uh, when do you need it? Well, this Friday. And it's like, okay, you're getting, I'll do it. It's gonna be a generic. I, I, I can't really do a whole lot with it. But if you give me over the summer, I can put some time and effort into it. Uh, secondly, um, come to me and let me know what do you want this for okay is it for a, a college is it for a job um which colleges because I, I can tailor it to a, a particular type of college mm -hmm. um, is this for athletic for me would it be for athletic reasons um do you, is it that you you want me to write from the perspective of a coach do you want me to write from the perspective of your classroom teacher do you want me to write perspective of your integrity um, or all of the above uh, that that helps okay 
Um, and from a standpoint of the student, if, if I were coming to you, knowing what I know now, I would write my own letter to you requesting this letter and outline that stuff. Um, how, how awesome is it to receive it that way? Oh, um, and, and how much does it inspire you to then really dig in and write those students that letter? Yeah, that, that, that shows me that you are, um, that you are committed, that this is important to you, as mm -hmm. opposed to the offhand comment that they see me in the hall, oh, by the way, can you write a letter of recommendation for me? I need it in four days. Yeah. Um, or you, it, that shows that you just, oh, you just happen to pop into your head as opposed to this is something that, that I really need to do. Um, in our district, um, we also ask the students to fill out what they, the, the guidance department refers to as a brag sheet, okay, mm -hmm. that they would then give to me and say, here's the things that I've done so that I'm not having to do the research to talk about, to talk yeah. about them. Um, honestly, I don't use that as much. Um, what I try and do with my uh, letters of recommendation, taking my own advice, is come up with an anecdote or a story to make that student stand out. And I can do that if I've got the time. Yeah. Um, if not, then it's going to be, you know, I, I just can't produce all that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll tell a story about something that the student did in class or a particular essay that stood out or um, that I think illustrates the kind of person that this is. Yeah. Um, and is there a time when you feel it's not appropriate for you to write a letter of recommendation for a student? Oh, yeah. I have had students come to me and say, uh, Mr. Reckman, you might write a letter of recommendation for me. I, I would tell them, these are sometimes are students that, you know, hey, I'll be happy to, but, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell the kid, you know, I think you're a wonderful kid, but remember, you plagiarized that essay, you know, remember last year I had to, you know, you made a mistake here, um, or, and I'm going to be honest, you know, with, with anyone. So if, even though we might have a good relationship, you've made some mistakes along the way and maybe you've learned from that. But um, yeah, there are times when I've, I've rejected a student and said, you might want to talk to, you know, someone else that can give you a more glowing one. Okay. Um, and if and that's, so, go ahead. Uh, how important is it for a student to really, in your opinion, and, and again, I don't think there's a, a, a written rule here, but, how important is it for the student to really think about who they're asking and, um, you know, have, have purpose in that, right? The, and the reason I say that is because obviously you teach AP language and composition. Everybody knows you know how to write. Yeah. Um, and you can make a great essay, there's no doubt. So, uh, but do some people come to you just because they think you're going to write it well? And how important is it for the student to pick a, an appropriate faculty member to do so? I think it's more important to pick someone that you have a relationship with. Okay. Even though that particular teacher maybe is not a skilled writer, mm -hmm. they will be skilled at talking about you. Yeah. That's much more important than the words that they, that they use, that they can talk about you as a person. Um, there are some colleges, and I think there are some where students have come to me and said they wanted an English teacher. Um, I think that's less rare. I don't think I'm seeing that as much as I used to. But I think more important, uh, if a student has an option of who they're looking for for letters of recommendation, pick someone that's got a relationship. And it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily has to be someone academic. Um, maybe it is your, your youth soccer coach, uh, the, the pastor of your church, the youth minister that you've worked with. Um, Anyone who is a respected part of your community that knows you well, I think is a good choice. Don't pick a relative. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, I, a question on the essays, back, back to that kind of subject for a second. Um, right, every school has its own essay prompts and then the Common App has its essay prompts. And I, I've always believed that when you write and you find that essay that we've discussed previously, you know, use it, right? Don't, don't feel, obligated to write a bunch of essays because that passionate work is what shows through and so that's what they want to see they don't want necessarily you to 
write something specific to them. Can you comment on that? I agree 100%. Uh, you might be applying to five, six, seven different colleges. And you might have out of that, the Common App is obviously very popular. And, um, but those other three or four colleges might have a different prompt, but you can typically take, and you can take that essay and tweak it around to fit their prompt. They're yeah. not really so much worried about you answering a specific question. The Common App, I think, gives you five different prompts, uh, maybe six. Um, they don't care which prompt you use. What they're doing is they, they just want you to pick something that you're comfortable with and that inspires you. So if there's another college that has a slightly different prompt, you can, that, that's not the issue. Yeah. But that being said, do answer the prompt. Um, okay. You don't have free reign to write about anything. Um, let the college make it clear that you didn't just cut and paste in the essay that you wrote for the other college, that you do know what they were asking for, that you did address that, and then you can tweak it around to fit, to get your, your essay in. Absolutely. And I think that's the best advice I've heard on that subject, which is it, it's okay to use the essay, but you, your intro may have to be different and your closing may have to be mm -hmm be different but the meat can typically be the same but you have to address the question that is asked if you choose a specific prompt um i i one of one of our college planning associates um gives the advice to parents you know have the child write an essay and then take the essay and give it to someone who doesn't know the child like I mean, maybe it's a co-worker or something and yeah. see if that person can come back and give you a little knowledge of who your kid is from that essay and I think it's an interesting thing because what we talk about is find the passion, right? And so if you find that passion and you read a, a disinterested third party, essentially reads it and can identify that passion, you probably have a pretty solid essay. You think that's fair advice? I love that idea. I've never thought of that. That is an absolutely fantastic idea. And the, honestly, Dave, when, when I have come in and worked with uh, students at Paradigm the last couple of summers, these are students from all over the place that I don't know. When I yeah. work with my students in my classroom, I know them. Um, and so that colors the essay. So when I get your students or people that I don't know, it, it, it's kind of cool. I mean, I've met some of the neatest kids through that, that I'm like, I'd really like to get to know you. You really are an interesting person. Um, but when I'm working with students that I, that I've been teaching for several months, it's like, oh, okay. I already knew this about you. Yeah. I got it. So it, it doesn't, it's not new and fresh. It's, it it's kind of, it but it, it, you know, it um, okay. Uh, to, to speak about another subject you teach is the AP language and composition. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of noise in the AP world right now. Mm -hmm. Should you do it? Should you not do it? Um, and obviously you're, you're in a position as the, the teacher of the, the class itself to identify students that are capable and students that might not want to do it. How do you go about that process with the student? And do you, do you require, are you, are you able to sign off on a student going into that class and do you get to choose that? And what, what do you look for from that? Well, there's in, in our district, um, there are policies about who gets to, to, to take an AP class and, it used to be much stricter and now it's pretty much opened up. But um, the, the, the one qualification we have is that in the previous year, if you've taken, for example, honors 10th grade English, you need a B or better and 80% or better in order okay. to sign up for, but then you can uh, certainly appeal that and, and say, Hey, I really want to. And I think that's where I am on that issue. I, I don't want to keep students out of my class, out of that class but I want them to be aware and I want them to be taking it for the right reason. Um, a lot of students take AP courses because that's where their friends are. That's, I, I wanna be with my, my friends and they know that they'll be in the same classroom with them if that's the case. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, that shouldn't be your motivation. Um, yes, you will be in an AP classroom, you're gonna be with more motivated students that's great. But if you're not passionate, you're not excited about that particular course, it's going to be painful. It's going to be rough. Um, 
I think to go uh, a slightly different direction with your question, um, as you're selecting classes, uh, especially for your upper grades, and, and more and more districts are offering more and more, op more and more AP options. That's wonderful. Please don't don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way. Um, I think that's a very good thing. But on the other end, don't overload yourself. Um, in my district, the junior year is when you typically all of a sudden have a plethora of uh, AP options available to you. So then I'll look at their schedules and we'll talk about it. I've got students taking four or five and a couple, several this year that were taking six AP courses. We have a seven period day. And they're excited, they're enthusiastic and they love it because many of the courses are taught by some of the, the more accomplished teachers and the, the, the subject matter is exciting and the, the course discuss, discussions are exciting. And I, I get all that, but Long about mid-October, late October is when, yes, it, <laughs> it implodes. Um, the, the tears begin, the exhaustion begins, they're, 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 they're fried. Um, some students don't handle that well, and, and it's not a badge of, somehow I, I think sometimes AP has become a badge of honor, it's become a Boy Scout badge that you want to, uh, Check off. Did it. Did it. Look at me. I, 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 dollar. Yep. Stop. Stop it. Um, instead, here's my advice on that. What do you love? I keep going back to that. You and I keep talking about that. What, what makes you passionate? What, if mathematics are your passion, load up on AP math. Okay? Don't take AP US history, if you find that drudgery, just because it's a high level course and it'll look good on my resume, resume and um, I, I, it's a weighted course and I'll get more, a higher GP out of it. Stop, don't do that. Um, this way, you'll be able to really dedicate yourself to the things that you're passionate about and you're excited about. Um, I want you to take, if you're in my class, take AP, language and composition, because you really want to improve your writing skills. Um, and you're willing to work at that. Um, I think this has been, a, in our district, I think it's been a relatively recent phenomenon within the last five years that uh, the, the overload, because we've offered so many more AP options. Again, I'll repeat, that's a good thing. Um, and, and this gets a, a little bit off topic. Um, administrations see that as a, it, it, is a, it is a cap feather for administrations to say that we have X number of students taking AP. So they're pushing it. Parents push it. Um, but I would say to the student, stop, uh, slow it down. It, to that point, I mean, it's a systemic push. Um, it yes. is. It is absolutely just, um, you know, the parents think the kids need to push themselves. The kids are told they need to push themselves. The administration wants to push the faculty to be qualified to teach the classes, and it's everybody pushing it. And, and it's interesting that you say the way you said it because you're spot on. I've talked to more admissions officers at schools, at colleges and universities across this country that say, listen, we do want you to push yourself. We do want you to take AP classes if you're if you're that quality of student to take them, but we don't want to see you taking AP classes just to take AP classes. And I asked uh, my alma mater, Franklin Marshall. I asked specifically. I said, "Listen, I took. I was an AP scholar. I had four APs. We were only allowed to take four, and I went to Devon Prep, and okay. Devon Prep was touted AP for years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the max we could take our senior year was four. And I ended up having to drop one because, again, it was just, it was too much. And my, it was, it was a uh, calculus that I ended up dropping down. And my math, I was done. I had reached my capacity of mathematics. And, you know, I was in AP chemistry. I was in AP English. Um, and I forget what the other one was. I think it was another science course. 
And, oh no, sorry, it was history. It was European history, I think. Mm -hmm. And the number one, all the history classes, whether kids understand this or not, you are going to cover more information in an AP history class than you can possibly read in the amount of time that you need to read it. It is a dump of information. Yes. Uh, and then the science classes are going to move at a pace that you might not be ready to move at. And so I asked specifically, if I were to get an A in an AP class, or sorry, if I were to get a C in an AP class versus an A in an honors class, what would the school prefer to see? And they said A in an, in an honors class all day long. To take to put the stress on the student at that level, colleges are very aware of the stress that students are under as a result of everything that we, we've already talked about today. Um, and they said, don't take the classes that, to your point, you're not passionate about. AP is meant to take a deeper dive into a subject matter that you truly enjoy. And if you go back to the beginning of our conversation, I talked about the self-awareness that students don't have. And part of self-awareness is understanding that I truly enjoy this subject matter. I would rather go deeper on this subject and not as deep on this subject. And that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to go all in on every class. Um, and I learned that lesson the hard way because I remember that October and I, it, I felt like the world was coming in six, seven, eight hours of homework a night playing two varsity sports. And it was just, there's not enough time. And the other thing that I realized is if you take AP classes, not all colleges are just going to waive that, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And so you may take that curriculum with the idea that you're not going to have to do it in college or that, it's that, it, that they're going to take care of it, and that's just not true. And the reality is if you end up in a, you know, a science uh, background and you've taken an AP math class, it's not, going to cla it's not going to get you out of taking that college level class. Um, and so for me it was, hey, I'm not gonna pursue high level mathematics. I got my calculus, I understand calculus enough. I had to take calculus my freshman year at Franklin and Marshall. And again, I got to the same conclusion. I have exhausted my comprehension of mathematics at calculus. And I was okay with that because I didn't exhaust my business acumen. I didn't exhaust my, my ability to understand history and all of that stuff. So I pursued those other areas. Um, and I think it's a great point you make that don't just take it to take it. Um, the other point that we have received from a lot of our admissions interviews that we've done is the idea that they want to see you take challenging classes to the extent that the school offers it. Mm -hmm. But if there's four levels of classes, they don't need to see you at the top level in all classes. The, the second level, the honors, and, and in some cases, even the regular classes. If you're going to go in into law, they don't need an AP biology. You know, if you want to go into business, that they don't they don't equal one another and that kind of brings me to the next subject matter i'd like to discuss with you um which is knowing what you want to do right there is so much pressure now for kids to know what job they want to know where they want to go to know what they want to major in um and i think it really creates a a, a hurdle for kids and, a, and another stress point how do you deal with the students that don't know what they want to do and concerned about that? And what's your advice to that subject? It's a great question because that was me. Okay. Coming out of high school, um, I was a good student and I uh, went to a, a school that a, a Devon prep type school where you're expected to go to college, yep. but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Not a clue. And my father's advice was, I can go back to that. What are you excited about? What do you enjoy? And I enjoyed literature, I enjoyed reading, um, I enjoyed writing. So I was gonna be in, I, I became an English major. And uh, my first thought was I'm gonna be a writer. And I remember my first uh, college course, uh, Xavier University in Cincinnati, a teacher, it was uh, actually for an English course for English majors, said, how many guys wanna be writers? And I raised my hand, he goes, prepare to starve. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And um, so eventually, yes, I, I graduated with, uh, and I'll get a quick story here, but um, I'll get to the point. I, I eventually graduated with an English degree, and I, I had also been uh, involved in track and field and cross country. And I had an extra year of eligibility left and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went, I was, I had enough credits. I could pick up a business degree very quickly in a year. 
Like that, that's, I'll make money in business. And I hated it. Absolutely. <laughs> no knock on your business there, Dave. No, no, no. I had debit, credit, and all those. It had absolutely no meaning to me. And I still got the degree. Okay. Yep. So I eventually, um, and, and I think this is to answer your question, um, and everyone's story will be different. Uh, it took me several years working in restaurants, working in other industries, and I got into the point where I was working for a, a large uh, restaurant chain where I would help open their stores. And I found I really liked that. I liked showing people how to do things. That was kind of cool. And I, and I always, you know, still had enjoyed the literature and also in the back, and I was still competing athletically. And I'm like, well, what profession could I go into where I would be showing people how to do things? I could keep my passion, my excitement for reading and writing, and I could coach, you know, my involvement in athletics. Well, duh, you know, it was what I absolutely, when people, when I was first started college and they said, you're an English major, oh, you're going to be a teacher. I said, absolutely not. You know, I had, I, I had uh, the mantra that those who can do and those who can't teach. And I didn't want to be the one who can't. And um, I got, got mm -hmm. over that hurdle and I've loved it ever since. Now, that story is what I often tell to students. who's like, I don't know what I want to do. Um, I don't think at 17, 18 years old, you're, you have to know what you want to do. Agreed. Um, explore, expose yourself to different things. Um, go into some work environments. And this is part of our technical writing course that I do is one of the requirements is that spend a day with someone in the career that you're interested in. And one of two things happen. They come out of it and go on, Mr. Recton, I love it. I didn't realize, you know, what it's like to be a pipe fitter. You know, this is really cool. And other times they come out and say, I always thought I wanted to be, you know, medical technician. That's awful. You know, I can't stand that. You know, I didn't realize. I always thought I wanted to work at a, with dogs. I didn't realize you got to pick up their poop, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what? That goes back to the self-awareness comment, right? Yes. You've got to get exposure to get aware. And, and the, the thought that at 17 or 18 years old, that you've got to know where you want to go and what you want to do and what you want to be and what the rest of your world, what the rest of your life has in store is just untrue. Now, I made a comment that the, the human brain's not fully developed until 26, 28 years old. I'm not saying wait until you're 26, 28. But man, the average person has seven careers, you know, they go through seven different jobs. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is, I think, and, and I think you'll agree as an educator that the best thing you can do in your education is learn how to learn Correct. and learn how to continue getting knowledge and getting growing and making, um, making investments in yourself to your own, your own uh, kind of it will present itself at some point, right? It always does. Um, you know, I had a, a, a crazy experience in my life where, um, you know, I was always told, hey, Dave, you are going to be so successful someday. And I thought about that comment. And when I graduated college with a business degree and a minor in economics, and I had a directive in psychology, and I'm going to be so successful, right? Everybody's told me I'm going to be so successful. And I'm like, okay, so how? How am I going to be successful? Yeah. What am I going to be so successful in? And, you know, I went through small business. I went through corporate America. And I, and I ended up where I needed to be, which was in my own business with an entrepreneurial mindset. But then also something that I'm passionate about is education. And so when I got to the financial planning uh, position and I was able to focus on helping kids get into college and making it affordable and the whole thing, my passion fit my my mental acuity and all of a sudden gangbusters and now i am successful and it created that that opportunity but i was 34 when i found uh, no sorry 32 when i found the passion right i was very interested and in, and in into business and into the planning and into the financial side but it wasn't passion until i could connect the dots with the college component so i think your advice is spot on let me give uh, one more point on that, uh, Dave. I think for the students that I work with, 
the first thing when you ask them in life, what do you want? They say, I want to be successful. And, and probably 90% of them, that's dollar signs. They want to make X amount of dollars. And, I, and when I ask them, how are you going to, I don't know. It doesn't make any difference. I just need to make X amount of dollars. Um, <clears throat> I think you, you reach a point in your life when you realize that it isn't about the dollars anymore. And, and I tell my students this, if you find what you're excited about, you will figure out how to make money at it. You will figure out how to make that profession give you the lifestyle that you want. Um, I, I've seen it over and over in my life where people have gotten into fields that theoretically should be, you know, well, you're not going to make much money at that. And no, maybe they're not millionaires, but they create a life for themselves that allows their work, their, their career to be what they love. And, uh, you know, as we're talking about careers and professions, I know it's cliche, but um, it, it is very true. If you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, and, and to that same point, I, I think it, it's, it's fascinating that people measure success in dollars. Okay. Uh, because I've never found the dollars to make me happy. Now, I, I, also, that's, I think, a privileged response to that, you know? Yes. I make good money. I am a, I have a comfortable lifestyle, so I don't have to worry about it. And for those people that do have to worry about it, I'm not insinuating in any way, shape or form that it's different, but the, the successes that I see, and, and you know what, I'm a coach at heart. I, I basically, as a business owner, I coach, I coach my staff, I coach people, I teach them to better themselves constantly. Um, and I've always found that the success happens when those around you find success, when those around you get to the point where, um, you know, you've imparted wisdom to them and been able to get the best out of them. Um, and the idea that you want to be successful, I think, goes back to the idea that we've talked about three or four times now, which is self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? Success is different for everybody. Right. And monetary success let me explain my vision of it, which is if you can live the comfortable lifestyle and you can take the vacation you want to take and, you know, you can have a family and you're not starving, that's success to find the love and all those different things, right? It's not necessarily being wealthy. Don't confuse wealth and success. They're not the same thing. Um, I've always often said, and, and Larry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct this one at you. The man with the pension is the successful man. <laughs> Because he does what his passion is, and when he's done doing what his passion is, his passion is paid for his future. And that's an amazing thing, right? It doesn't happen every day. And so um, the idea that, you know, you can continue to live the lifestyle that you, you love and the way that, you know, your future has in store for you, I think is an amazing success story, right? To not have to worry about it. Um, and money is a big worry for a lot of people, and I don't want to underplay that at all. Um, but it's, it's the idea that your, your success, my, my vision of success has changed since I was 20. You know, I was focused on money. My vision of success now is I have four children. It's creating opportunities and successful children. I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about them and I want to give them the tools, you know? And so success to me is having four children that have happy, successful lives and, and more so I'll even take it down to an even better to have confident children that are comfortable with who they are. Yes. If, if I can do that in life and I don't have to worry about the, you know, all the things that go through every parent's minds, the, you know, the bullying and the self-esteem issues and all this stuff that happens, if I can, if I can provide them that, to me, that's success, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that the point and the reason I say it this way is for all those kids that we're talking to in this uh, podcast, it's, Success comes. Success is, is developed by your, your circumstances and your surroundings. Your eyeball of success or your vision of success at 20 is so much different than your vision at 30 and your vision at 40 and your vision at 50. Um, success it evolves as you evolve, right? Um, so don't get so stuck on what you consider successful today. Agreed very much.
And I want to just, um, I have this book that I think is probably one of the best, best books. It speaks to me. It's called The Laws of Lifetime Growth. And it's by Dan Sullivan. It's an incredible book. He lays out the 10 laws of lifetime growth. Um, and the growth in my eyes is success. Whether you're growing in your spirituality, whether you're growing in your personal satisfaction, whether you're growing in your golf game, whether, you know, what the improving it is growth to me. And, and if you're not improving, well, what is there, right? So be trying to improve something. And the, the, the one that I always, uh, find to be the most inspirational is always make your contribution bigger than your reward. And so if you can contribute and, and you're more worried about your contribution, it comes back to you. That reward will follow. So I think there's great stuff in the laws of lifetime growth. Absolutely. I agree with that a hundred percent. There is a lot of satisfaction and you've mentioned it when you're talking about your children and I, and I, I have two children also um, and that's enormous and I know we're not speaking to people who, who have children particularly um, and I get a lot of satisfaction in my job seeing students grow. Um, it is so exciting to see, and, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate and very blessed to have this opportunity to work with people, young people. And I love that. And friends of mine say, how do you, how do you stand them? You know, they're, they're, they're so moody and they're, you know, they're, yeah, there is some of that, but to see a spark, the excitement in their eyes. That being said, one of the most depressing sights are seeing a 17 or 18 year old who's already defeated by life. They've yeah. given up. It's, they don't look for anything else, you know, and I'll ask them, what do you, what are your goals? And they'll, they'll say to get by, you know, I just want to get by. And that's sad. It breaks my heart. And they're, 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 I think they're being honest because that's where they are. Maybe at, at, at that point in life, whatever has happened in their life. And, and, and I think we do need to, to mention this. Um, <clears throat> you're going to be faced with challenges. Okay. You, you need to set goals, but there's going to be obstacles along the way. Um, and everyone's personal, financial, social situations are different. Um, you may be and speaking to the students who may be watching, you may be in a home right now where, um, that's abusive, that, uh, there's discord, uh, there's financial issues. Um, you may have personal problems in your life. There may be uh, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Those are very real. Don't, don't minimize that. That's part of, of life. That's part of growing up. Um, but as long as that goal or that dream is there and it's big enough, you'll figure out how to get around it. You keep, keep that present so that you can get around the things that are going to happen to you. Um, so no. make, make the dream bigger than the obstacle. Absolutely. Always. And, and, you know, to, to that same point, I, I, I remember a, a line from one of the Rocky movies was it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. Right. Mm -hmm. And life sloppy. Life can get messy. Things can go sideways quick. Uh, coronavirus is a perfect example of it, right? Um, and that's a, we're all dealing with that situation, but everybody's got their own challenges. Um, and at, at some point, you know, I think the, the thing you say about goals, Larry, is incredibly important, right? And it doesn't have to be some outlandish way out there goal, but it's got to be bigger than the obstacle that you face. And it's got to be something that gets you motivated to keep going. Um, and that's huge because, uh, you know, for, from my perspective, I don't think we teach enough of that at, at the high school level. I don't think that there's, you know, I think there's a lot of good coaches out there that teach that stuff and, and sports do it. But for those kids that aren't in sports, you know, they may not have that type of, of, uh, direction you know set the goal out and and i will say one thing and i think you can agree a little goal that's achieved and another goal set beyond that that's called progress and man progress feels good you know and it doesn't have to be outlandish progress it can be simple uh, and i'm also reminded of a movie uh which is called what about bob where they talk about baby steps you know 
sometimes, man, just just take that first step, and you, you never know what the snowball effect can be. So I think that's incredible advice. Um, and and the other thing I'll say to that is, no no child should be afraid to talk to somebody that they can trust and that they can unload some of the burden on. Right? We we go back to the brains not developed until 26, 28, and I would say my brain probably wasn't developed until I was 35. Okay, I'm I'm still I'm, I'm getting there. But the idea that, that people are willing to help, I think we're now in a more helpful society than we have, ever have been. Judgment is real, and, and some will judge, but find that person that won't judge and that person that's there to help you and, and help pull you through that stuff and give you guidance uh, to the goals and things like that. So that's awesome. My last question of the day. I have found every successful person, and by all means of success, I consider you a successful person, Larry, in your life, your career, and what you've done. I have found everybody has a book that was influential. Uh, mine, I shared, was The Laws of Lifetime Growth, and I read it five years ago, which is probably when my brain really clicked into, hey, I'm all about growth. What book, and I, it, whether it's literature, whether it's something, what book, or books, if you've got, a, if you got because you're a well-read individual and you, you have multiple, oh, wow. what books would you recommend that people read that changed your perspective on things? It's a great question. Oh my gosh, there's so many of them for me. I, it's there, there, there. There's. I'm not. I went through a phase in my life um, early on, um, probably when I was. I'd gone through a phase where I was very financially motivated. Okay, the teaching profession, as wonderful it is, was not. Was yep. not. In, in the mid nineties, my, my friends were raking in money and I wasn't. And so I went through a phase of self-help books, the magic of thinking big, think and grow rich. What do you say when you talk to yourself? Um, wonderful books. Yep. I, 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 I highly recommend, you know, uh, Dale Carnegie's, uh, how to win friends and influence That's an influence people. That's a classic. Yep. yep. Uh, Acres of diamonds. You can go through all these things. <clears throat> And they were very powerful. Um, I, and one of my favorites is, what do you say when you talk to yourself? Um, we, we fill our heads with negative thoughts. And um, I use this a lot with my athletes because in, in track and field and cross country, you step on the line and you're going to go through some pain. I'm a distance coach. And how do I prepare myself for that? And my saying is my thought in my brain is, because we all have an inner voice, is the inner voice telling me, uh, don't fail, don't, don't, don't stop, uh, this is going to hurt. Or is it, I can do this, I am, I am a winner, I will do this. And you always talk about what is about to happen in the present tense or in the future tense, as if it is, it is happening, it will happen. The, so those books are very powerful to me. Um, I go a little bit another tangent there. Um, when I look at literature students often, you know, why are we reading this? I, I found that um, I, literature, old literature, yes, books that were written hundreds of years ago, I take a lot of great comfort in knowing that they struggle with the same things we're struggling with. You know, I'll, I'll read uh, Shakespeare and find out that, you know, he really was trying to figure out what makes a person good and what makes a person evil. Um, and so, and I get a lot of comfort in knowing that. Um, and not to get overly religious and whatever it is, I, I happen to be Christian. so. The Bible is a, is a source for me, and I still struggle with trying to figure out everything that that book is saying. Um, yep. And I have a group of friends that we do, that we study with, and we talk once a week with uh, particular passages. Um, so that's been very valuable to me. And, and you find, again, I'll go back to, you know, if, it, if it is a religious, whatever your text is, um, what is going to be the source? And study it. You know, and look closely at what it has to say. Um, so on that, I don't know if I've answered that very closely, but I, I'm, a, I'm a voracious reader. I read a wide variety of things. Um, 
and one of the things that I've also found with reading, uh, particularly reading uh, fiction, and I'm a big advocate of it, is uh, a sense of empathy. I, I push myself to read things that are outside my comfort zone, that talk about people in lives that I don't live. Um, and when you read about an author who is uh, talking about our characters who are going through a struggle that I may never see and may never experience, it gives me a sense of, a broader sense of humanity. Um, Would you say that, you're, you're seeking perspective? I, I don't go into it with that. I'm, I'm seeking a good story. <laughs> I, I think it's, inter you know, I want, I, I'm not picking up a book going, oh, I really want to know what it's like for this person. I'm picking up a book because this story looks interesting okay. and it's outside my experiential world. Uh, this will be in naturally then from there, I'll get a sense of, uh, of what their world may be like. Um, when a student says, I don't want to read this book because this is about uh, a woman from the 16th century whose life has absolutely no meaning to me. Um, well, you know, maybe you're not a uh, 16th century female Muslim, but it'll give you a perspective about the way that people think that's maybe not the same as yours. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've I'm, I'm a voracious reader of business and mm -hmm. um, the, I have not spent as much time uh, in, in the fiction realm. And the idea to me that, you know, there is everything to be gained from books. There's everything to be, you know, and, and I go, if I'm struggling, the first thing I do is figure out, all right, what's the book I'm going to try and read that's going to help me through the struggle. And whether it's the Bible, whether it's whatever it may be, Mm -hmm. you know, look to the book to, to help at least broaden the perspective and give you some of that. So I think your all your answers were, were excellent. And, um, you know, I think coming from your background, you know, having read as much as you have, it's probably pretty hard to, to narrow those down. So I, I appreciate, I appreciate you kind of giving a, a, a full perspective on that side. Um, is there any advice that you would give a budding college student um, that you haven't in this and, uh, or, or advice to high school students, any of our, is, is there something that, that makes you tick and advice that you give that you believe is, is true through and through? I think what we, and we, 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 we keep circling back to it is be excited. Find the passion. Find your passion. Um, Self-awareness, um, don't do things, don't make decisions to please other people, to please your parents, to please your, your, your teachers. Don't, even though you maybe have been playing the piano since you were eight years old and you're sick of it, find something else, yep. okay? You, you, maybe you're really good at it, but if it's no longer giving you happiness, don't keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and you may come back to it. That's what I found. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I stopped playing baseball my junior year of college and uh, I, I was done. I was burnt out. I was spent. I had spent way too much time on a diamond, too many cold February days on the practice field. And I was just done. And when I graduated college and I was looking for something to fill the time between my day job, I walked into All-Star Baseball Academy in Downingtown and said, hey, listen, can I give lessons or coach or, you know, whatever. And getting back into the sport in a different facet from the coaching side fulfilled that desire to be around that game. And so um, I think, you know, to the, to the point you make about the, the, the piano player that's given, you know, half of their life or three quarters of their life to practice that thing, you can step aside and you can come back. It yes. doesn't have to be all or nothing. And so I think that's another thing. And, and it's an incredible point you bring up that, you know, kids are, 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 you know, pushed by society, parents, teachers, and everybody coaches to, to continue to excel in, in certain things. But if that passion goes away, that can be a very devastating 
uh, thing to continue. And, and burnout is real, you know, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes step aside and you can find the love for something that you loved previously and you can find it all over again. So that's incredible advice, Larry. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the questions I have. I think this has been awesome. Um, I, appreciate, I appreciate your time more than you can imagine. This is elite college knowledge. Um, and again, our special guest today is Larry Recton, a 32 year veteran in the uh, school system an educator, a coach, um, and from all intents and purposes, from my perspective, a great human. So thank you very much. Thank for you. Everything. Appreciate it.